Should I ask for a show of hands how many of you used to be something else? <laughs> there we go. Uh, <clears throat> well, um, it seems to me everybody I know used to be something else. I don't know about you. Everybody I run into, maybe it's because of what I am, but they say, oh, yeah, I used to be a Catholic, or I used to be a... a, a I actually met somebody who said he used to be a meditator, but now he's a Catholic. I haven't figured that one out, but that's, that's the direction he went in. So uh, I am allowed to stand this far here and this far here. Is that right, Joe? Okay. Right. So if I start moving that way, somebody can tame me. Um, so... Um, my life can be divided into sort of three sections. Um, the sort of Catholic Jesuit part up till I was 42, and then a period of searching, which is the fun part, I think, where I dabbled in everything. And, um, and now, uh, I th- I th- well, I hesitate to say this, but I think I'm settled into shamanism as sort of a permanent thing. We had a... Uh, my wife and I went out for a 28-day uh, shaman training with Alberto Violdo in um, Joshua Tree Retreat and Conference Center. And we were initiated into um, the Caro lineage of the Peruvian shamans. And um, there was an actual shaman there to do the initiating. And there was like various stations you went to. So the last station was Alberto, our, our shamanic teacher. And you would go up, and he would sort of give you a, a blessing in his own way. And he, he would give us a stone with a drop of blood uh, from the uh, Caro lineage on it. And as he handed you the stone, uh, he would give you a little message, whatever his intuition was. So when uh, he came to me, or when I came to him, he handed me my stone, and he said uh, he and I are the same age, which would be... Um, over 65, and he, well over, and he said, uh, you think your life is behind you, which in fact I did not, but he said, you think your life is behind you, but in fact, it's just beginning. So uh, I don't want to say I'm settled into shamanism forever. There may be some other whole thing going on. So I grew up in Washington, D.C. in a Jesuit parish. I had a rather difficult relationship with my father, um, it was so difficult, I don't even think he was aware that it was difficult. Um, but that, that put me in a position of searching for a, a father. So uh, we were in this Jesuit parish, and uh, I was an altar boy and all that. And uh, They were great. They were smart. They were sensitive. They were interested. And um, I thought they were terrific. And uh, probably like most of you, I, I was sort of this spiritual type when I came on the planet, and I kind of became became aware of that as the years went by, and looking back, I would say that. Uh, And um, so I was interested in all things religious at that time, because that seemed to be the only thing that was spiritual, was what was religion. So I went the whole nine yards through the Catholic grade school, Jesuit high school, Jesuit college, and then I joined uh, the uh, Maryland province of the Jesuits at Wernersville, Pennsylvania in 1968. So um, the first really big moment of my life uh, in terms of spiritual enlightenment uh, came uh, there when I was a novice in the Jesuits. We were making a five-day um, directed retreat. You know, they're silent. and uh, The idea is to close down the senses like other things, like a vision quest, so they're silent. Anyway, on the fifth day, um, I was praying with Luke uh, 13, and uh, I'm, I'm going to move through this pretty quickly because I become quite emotional whenever I try to tell it. In fact, my wife told me to skip this part because I always start sobbing and I don't get on with it. So I'm going to hit the highlights here. (laughs) But um, uh, I figured if I was going to be a priest, I needed to be holy. And I didn't feel holy. I didn't feel like I knew how to pray. Whenever I went to pray, I got bored silly. So I began sort of demanding of God. The novice director had said, you know, if you're not getting what you want, you can bang on the pew. Well, we, we were in our little rooms and It wasn't time to bang on anything because it was on silence, but I sort of began to tell God off, which I would recommend to all of you, if you're having any issues with God, you're allowed to do that. And I said, look, if you want me to be a priest, you have to to communicate yourself to me. 
I've, I've seen many priests, and some of them are really holy, and that's who I want to be, and the others are just reading from their theology notes. So I want to be authentic. So, uh, you know, I'll, let's let something happen here. So we were praying with Luke 13, which is the story of um, uh, the servants waiting for their master to return from the wedding feast. And I had already settled into boredom. That's when I started uh, telling God off. And, uh, and being ready for the master's return. So I'm sitting there saying, okay, uh, this means um, you should be, you'd lead a good life so that when you die you'll go to heaven. And how am I supposed to spend an hour on this? So then I told God off. <clears throat> Here we go. Um, and I felt this power at my feet about um, uh, if he finds you waiting <clears throat> in the wee hours he will sit you down and wait on you. And this is what happened to me. And, of course, as you know from your own experiences, you can't put it into words. Uh, But I sensed uh, this presence at my feet, that my feet were being washed. And then I remembered Peter at the Last Supper saying, well, not just my feet, do all of me. So I, I felt this, I don't know what, energy, power, presence come over my whole self. And this went on for quite a while. And, um... The next day, uh, I, I, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I just wanted to sort of preserve this. And uh, I went in and talked to the novice director, and he said, well, Bill, it's just the beginning. And I thought, wow, if that's the beginning, I think I'll stick around for this. Um, but I found that uh, I could understand the scriptures from then on, almost everything, not quite. Um, when the novice director was giving a talk, I could sort of complete his sentences. Have you ever had that experience? You listen to somebody and you say, it's going to do, do, do. Um, So that's uh, the big moment in my life uh, that changed the course of everything because then I wasn't just somebody that was kind of interested in religion and stuff, but uh, I, I became a mystic in that moment, like most of you, and uh, began directing my life as, as well as you can with a vow of obedience in that direction. Okay, I got ordained a priest. So I was a Jesuit for 20 years, and I was a priest for the last 11. And um, as I functioned as a priest and got used to it, and you know, my goal had been to be a priest, and now I had been a priest for a while. So I began uh, being more in touch with uh, what's going on way down in there. And I began uh, thinking about the church's teaching And um, it seemed to me, um, well, you seem to get two versions in the Catholic Church. Like, there's no salvation outside the church. Well, yes, there is. But you have to go through Jesus. At least that's what I understood, which didn't make sense. So I began thinking of somebody like Gandhi, you know, who's a better Christian than most Christians. And does that mean he can't be saved? So that's a little funny. I don't quite get that. I began uh, sensing the inner dimensions of the gospel, Um, which I didn't hear much of from the pulpit. Uh, And one time at Ocean City, um, I heard an especially annoying sermon. um, Because I was down there on vacation, so I went to church instead of being the the priest. And uh, the gospel was uh, Martha and Mary. And, um, you know, it's uh, uh, Jesus is visiting them. He's their cousin. And uh, uh, Mary sits at his feet in awe and wonder at what he's saying. Uh, and Martha is busy with uh, doing all the work. And um, the priest, and this would happen every year, but it especially annoyed me this particular year, he would say, uh, so we want to pray for vocations uh, to the priesthood and to the uh, religious life for women uh, because they are merry and they have chosen the better part. So it's like all you uh, inferior lay people out there should, should pray for the, the people Jesus really likes. Uh, now, since then, um, so, some theologian has said he, uh, I can't remember who it is right now, maybe if Linda remembers me saying this, she can tell me, um, saying that uh, actually Martha was cooler than Mary because she could do two things at once. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure women everywhere appreciate that. Um, so then uh, things began coming to me in synchronicity fashion that would sort of speak to this inner meaning of the gospel thing. So John Sanford, good Episcopalian, uh, his book, The Kingdom Within, became very important to sort of validate my, my feelings. 
and uh, Morton Kelsey, his book, The Other Side of Silence. So those two were a big, big turning point um, because he, he was having all these experiences. And you, don't, uh, you don't hear about them much. You hear about them, uh, like if you're a Jesuit, you hear about Ignatius Loyola's uh, vision at the chapel at Lestorda or by the River Cardinaire or whatever you are. You hear about your founder's visions, but um, there's sort of an understanding that you don't talk about it. It's kind of bragging, which in a way it is, but it, it also kind of cuts down on conversation in religious life, I would say. Maybe that's why everybody's so quiet at dinner in religious life. That's it. Okay, so uh, in 1988, after 20 years in the Jesuits, I had this deep interior experience of being loved at the core of my being. Loved at the core of my being. And that changed everything. So this was like the next big thing. Uh, so that first thing with Luke is when I was 23. Now I'm uh, 33, I think. No, excuse me, I'm 43. <laughs> I'm 43. Um, and uh, so um, my body returned to its uh, original adolescent shape. <laughs> um, and... Uh, I left the Jesuits, and people would ask me, why did you leave? And I would say, well, I don't really feel like I left. I feel like it left me, because I said it was like a snake shedding its skin. But I was a, a little uncomfortable with that, because at that time, I didn't know that snakes shed their skin because they didn't fit in the skin anymore. It was the only way they could grow. Uh, I didn't know why they shed their skin, but I felt a little uncomfortable comparing this major moment in my life to a, a serpent because what I was thinking of was the serpent in the garden. But nonetheless, that's what my psyche was presenting. You shaman types will recognize that as uh, the animal world uh, speaking to me. So, uh, like a snake shedding its skin. So, had I stayed in the Jesuits, uh, whom I look back on fondly, a lot of great things happened in there, and uh, a lot of good friends, uh, of which I have only one left, um, but uh, people say, are you sorry you left? Are you sad? And I say, no, there's some nostalgia. Maybe some of you out there will relate to this. There's nostalgia, but no lament. I don't regret the decision. Uh, it just would have been uh, stunting my spiritual growth if I had stayed. So the very day that I left the Jesuits, and this is a vivid memory in my mind, I'm walking down the street, and I'm still, I didn't have any plan, and I just... Uh, figured um, I'm still this spiritual type, so I guess something's going to happen. So I said to my soul, uh, what now? What do I do now? And, and I literally just walked out the door <laughs> like 15 minutes before. And what uh, I heard from within me was shaman, and I didn't know what to do with that. Um, I kind of liked the word. I was sort of sympathetic to the idea, but I didn't know how to connect with that. I didn't know how to where do you find shamans and what do you do when you get there? And my imagery of it was of um, uh, uh, in Africa and, you know, jungles and things and all these wild dances going on. So I figured, well, <clears throat> okay. So <clears throat> a few years went by and I got all these uh, really boring jobs because you have to make money and that really annoyed me. And, um, uh, oh, I had been in Jungian analysis uh, the last nine months that I, nine months that I was uh, in the Jesuits, and um, when you uh, when you start analysis, uh, you have what's called a threshold dream, a threshold dream, and uh, that's that means it's early in your analysis and um, it's going to set the tone for your your time with the analyst. So I was thinking, well, gee, maybe mine will be about the angel Gabriel appearing. And, Choirs of angels will sing. And, uh, instead, what I got was um, uh, there were all these people in. Um, I for, one had black hats and the other had white hats. I forget which, but one crowd was chasing the other crowd. And, well, the other crowd seemed to be the good guy, good guys, and uh, they were after blood. And they chased them into a barn, and uh, uh, the bad guys hung up all the good guys uh, on meat hooks and slaughtered them. And there was blood everywhere absolute violence. And I thought, oh man, I have to 
I have, maybe, maybe tomorrow's really my threshold dream. <laughs> we don't want this one. So, uh, so I crawled into my analyst's office and said, here's, here's the dream. Well, he didn't have much to say about it. That always annoyed me about analysis. And, you know, it was like, okay, what do you make of that? I know what I make of it. I want to know what you make of it, but they don't want to tell you that. So to uh, develop this little theme, so I had this dream. So after I left, someone hands me a book by Stan Groff. This is another synchronicity. Pardon? LSD. LSD? Oh, yeah, he was one of the early experimenters with uh, psychedelics in Prague there, or wherever he was. And when uh, communism became a problem, he, uh, he left, Stan Groff left, uh, Prague and, and came to uh, Stanford. Um, and now he's the big guy in consciousness. So uh, some, somebody uh, handed me a book by him called Spiritual Emergence when, when Personal Transformation Becomes a Crisis. And they wanted my opinion on a chapter about the hero's dream. Uh, which I read and gave them my opinion, but then I was leafing through it, and my eyes fell upon a, a description uh, very similar to the dream that I had had of everybody being hung up on meat hooks. And uh, it's in Chapter 5, if you're interested, and um, it, it's a series of essays by different people, the book is. Um, and it said, uh, when you have a dream like this, what it means is that your entire worldview has to change. It has to die. And if it doesn't, you're, you're going to be treading water the rest of your life. Um, so I thought, wow. So now I like my threshold dream. That was a good dream now. And uh, so I set about saying, okay, well, that's what happened. My, uh, or at least I left the Jesuits. That, uh, that's all I had ever wanted to be. So I had an apartment looking out on the Delaware River there in Philadelphia. Um, I left the Jesuits from old St. Joe's down at 3rd and Walnut. and got an apartment on Laetitia Street. Um, and that's, I left, that's where my analysis took place. And uh, so I pondered what to do. So um, one of the things that was a little strange was when Sunday came, you know, I wasn't intending to leave the Catholic Church. I was intending to leave the Jesuits. But when Sunday came, um, I didn't feel any inclination to go to church. And I thought, hmm. So my intuition had been doing pretty well up till then. So I said, well, okay, I guess I won't go to church. So Easter rolled around, and I was still in the neighborhood. I was being a bad boy. I had gotten an apartment in the territorial neighborhood of Old St. Joe's Parish. I was supposed to disappear. That's what you do when you're a Catholic priest and you leave, and they tell the parishioners you're, you've been reassigned to Timbuktu or something, and uh, everybody was, what? And so I, I hadn't had a chance to say goodbye to anybody, and that didn't seem humane to me. So I got an apartment just three blocks from the rectory on Laetitia Street there. And uh, I invited all the, all the parishioners for a, a housewarming, and they brought all this stuff I needed to, to furnish my apartment. So Easter came, and some of the ones that I had been giving direction to came by, and um, they had noticed uh, I hadn't been showing up at church, and uh, they sort of cautiously said, are you, are, you, uh, are you coming to church for Easter Sunday or Good Friday? And I, <laughs> it's a little awkward, because you don't want to dismantle people's faith commitment but you want to tell the truth at the same time. And uh, it's further awkward if you can't quite explain why. But I said, no, I'm not, because it's just not there. I said what I just said to you. I, I meant to leave the Jesuits. I didn't mean to leave the Catholics, but here I am. And uh, somebody else along the way said uh, she had tried to leave the Catholic Church numerous times, but she said, I just can't do it. It's in there, and I can't get rid of it. So uh, there, there's a little bit of that in me. Uh, mostly it's Jesus. I like Jesus. Okay, so that's the dream and the Stan Groff business. So I went to Prague. I said, I have to meet this Stan Groff guy. Well, then I discovered he uh, has a conference every two years in transpersonal psychology, spiritual psychology. And uh, he was having it in Prague because it was the first time since he had left and the communists and all, the first time he could get back in. The communists were out by then. So we went to Prague. I wanted to meet Stan Groff. Um, 
and the whole crowd was there, uh, whom I mostly was not aware of then, but it was Ram Das and Joan Boroshenko and uh, John Mack. Do you know John Mack? He's the alien abduction guy. He was there. And uh, <laughs> well, uh, one time I was, I was telling this story in the, the group center, uh, have you been abducted? And I said, no, but I'm an alien, and you've all just been abducted. <laughs> I thought that was fun. So <clears throat> I met all these people, and I said, now this is my crowd. This, I, they speak my language, and they're all on some slightly different path, but they're all free, and they're saying what they think, and they've had all these experiences, and it comes down to consciousness and awareness and uh, uh, breathing and meditation, and... Um, and that was cool. Um, I'm standing, uh, I'm st so we met in this big Baroque theater. And uh, they had created a little bookstore across the lobby, so I wanted to be the only one there so I could get my book and, and, and pay and get out. And so um, I'm in the bookstore across the lobby, and I sense this presence. I'm the only one there. I thought, I sense this presence, and I look up, and here's Ram Das standing in the doorway. And he's uh, quite diminished physically now because he had a stroke. But at that time, this was 1992, he was this huge polar bear of a man with this mane of white hair and this white beard. And he's quite, uh, quite imposing. I had already met him coming up the stairs. We had just, I said, you're Ram Das. <laughs> he said, I am. I'm the Bella Brown. Great. So, and, uh, off he went into the theater. So anyhow, there he is, and here I am. And I looked up, and I looked back, and I smiled and looked back down, and I felt he didn't move. And I looked back up, and he's still staring right at me. So uh, I kind of walked into him or, or responded to, to him locking into me, not sure which, and he starts to walk towards me. So I'm behind a table like I am now. So I, I came around. I sensed we were somehow going to meet, and... Uh, uh, so we approached each other, and we're still looking right in each other's eyes. And uh, when he gets to me, uh, he leans down. He's much taller, and he envelops me in this bear hug. And then and his, we're cheek to cheek. His mouth's right next to my right ear, and he starts to stand up, and my, my feet come off the floor. And as he's standing up, he's giving this big inhale, and then he goes, in my right ear, he goes, ah. And then he set me back down. And I can still feel that today. I can still feel that, ah, from Ram Dass. Anyhow, that's a little anecdote along the way. Okay, so I started exploring everything in the 1990s after this experience in Prague of meeting all these people. Um, I also spent time at the tomb of uh, King Wenceslaus, uh, across the river there in Prague because I was born on September 28th at the Feast of St. Wenceslaus. And when you go to Catholic school, you know, everybody's Patrick and Joseph and Michael, and nobody ever heard of Wenceslaus, and I never quite knew who he was. So I found out there, and I, I spent uh, about an hour at the tomb of uh, King Wenceslaus. That was fun. Okay, so I began exploring uh, different things and feeling very free about it. Um, I developed a spiritual center that basically was wherever I was, but it, it was a nonprofit and worked out of my home in Washington. And um, I came across Thich Nhat Hanh somehow and got very into Buddhism and went to a couple of his talks, made a retreat down in Key West with him, um, with uh, a few hundred other people. And um, uh, we met in the parking lot of a golf resort in a big white tent, and um, he, uh, <clears throat> there was a wind, terrible wind, and it was blowing up dust, and it was making the sides of the tents flap, and uh, we were all getting annoyed because we couldn't hear him. And uh, so he, he looked in the direction we were all looking, and he said, the wind's bothering you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. And uh, he said, well... <clears throat> Instead of getting angry, why don't we welcome Brother Wind into the tent? So he said, I just want you to turn and breathe deeply. <sighs> welcome Brother Wind. He's not our enemy. So we did. And do you know the wind died down? How about that? <clears throat> 
reminds me of Jesus. Who is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? I think Jesus was a shaman. Uh, so Thich Nhat Hanh. So uh, that was exciting. In 1994, um, uh, a movie, a horror movie came out with Jack, Wilson, Jack Nicholson in it called Wolf. And um, it was a horror movie, and I knew that, and I felt it was beneath my dignity to want to go to a horror movie, and yet it was drawing me with this real strong resistance. <clears throat> so uh, I said to myself something like, well, if it's around two weeks from now, I'll, I'll go and see it. So it was. So I slunk in, hoping nobody who knew me saw me. Uh, this is in Washington at the MacArthur Movie Theater, if you know Washington. And it was a Sunday afternoon matinee. There were about six people in, in, the, in the church. And um, in the opening scene, uh, Jack's driving through the snows in a forest, and he sees this wounded animal, uh, and he gets out to help. Uh, well, it turns out it's a wolf, and uh, the pack emerges from the woods, and he gets bitten. Now, wolves don't actually attack humans unless they're starving, uh, but this was a Hollywood wolf, so he got, they were after humans. So he got bitten, and over the course of the rest of the movie, he gradually turns into a, a wolf. If you've seen it, it's, it's kind of a fun shamanic thing because his senses get sharper. And he hears things on the other side of the building. But in this opening scene, when the wolves came on the screen, um, all this energy began uh, charging through me. And uh, I, I, I'm, I have never experienced anything like that before or since. But it was, it was like the seat was vibrating, except it wasn't. It, it was me that was vibrating. And uh, I thought, well, this is interesting. So, wolf. <clears throat> and then I'm thinking, shaman. Because I, I, I was waiting for these shaman people to show up at my doorstep or something. Um, so I could get on with my shaman thing, whatever that would be. Anyway, I uh, investigated wolf, and it turns out... Uh, uh, some are ab aboriginal people, because of his connection to the moon, which they consider mystical, uh, is considered a spiritual teacher. So I thought, ah, so I must uh, have some wolf stuff going on. Um, another theme that's been run through my life is that I always seem to get drawn into prisons, at least for a while, wherever I go, um, to um, be there for two or three years, and then I'm gone. I don't know what that's about. Okay, um, so as a result of all this, uh, we began taking little weekends in shamanism. In 2015, uh, and this is the concluding episode here, um, I, was, I was giving a, a class um, at Shepherd, we live in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. I was giving a class at Shepherd University, and the class was uh, on psychology and spirituality. It was a, an adjunct course. And um, the chairperson, had, who was a friend of mine, had uh, sort of generally mentioned that the department was very scientific, very scientific crowd. So she said, you know, they'll be happy if, uh, if they're confident you're just teaching things that science can, can bear out. And I said, well, I don't know about that. She said, well, I know. She said, I... I don't know about it either, she said, but um, I just wanted you to be aware of that. So I got on the internet to, um, to see what I could come up with as a textbook for this course. And uh, so I googled science and psychology or something. Anyhow, um, I found a book called uh, Power Up Your Brain, The Neuroscience of Enlightenment by Alberto Viola. And I thought, perfect title, it's even got science in it, so it can look good over there. Full store shelf. And um, <coughs> plus, it sounded like something I could get excited about. So I got that. So Alberto, uh, and I taught his book, it turns out he has 17 books he's written. Um, and uh, I started reading them, and then I noticed he was going to be at Kripalu in Massachusetts, so I went up there. Um, spent, I did a, a group weekend with him there, and then um, Linda, my wife, and I went to another one at Omega in 2017. And um, I'm thinking that this is where the shaman thing is going to come together for me, because 
he, he was this uh, incredibly cool guy. He left Cuba when Castro came in, got his doctorate at Stanford, it sounds like Stan Grau, uh, had a lab where he was studying consciousness, his field, um, but decided he wasn't going to learn about consciousness from looking at uh, cross-sections of the human brain in these bottles. So he had heard about the shamans, and he just went to Peru to look up the shamans. And he ended up staying, and he's got a PhD in psychology when he arrives. He's a young man, he's still in his 20s. He spends the next 30 years uh, living among the shamans of uh, especially Peru uh, and the Amazon region. So, uh, after a while, they told him to come back to the United States and to teach uh, shamanism to the West, including Western Europe, because, they said, they said, our young people, uh, they're only interested in smartphones, but this Peruvian shaman said to him, but your young people are spiritually hungry. I hope that's true. I haven't really seen a whole lot of it. It seems to me they're into their smartphones too, but I hope that's true. So, he has a 28-day program. If, if you would like to uh, learn more about him, his website is uh, thefourwinds.com. It's all one word, T-H-E-F-O-U-R, wins.com. And he's got an international organization now. So he has this 28-day uh, intensive shamanic training that's considered uh, the, the gold standard of all this sort of thing. So Linda and I went out there last March. It costs a whole lot of money, and we didn't know where we were going to get it. And out of nowhere, another synchronicity, uh, someone uh, who had become aware that we needed money uh, called up and offered to give it to us, uh, which she did. Well, to let, lend it to us. Still paying it back. Uh, but it got us there. And for 28 days, we were out in the um, Mojave Desert. We were at Joshua Tree Retreat and Conference Center, uh, which is set very much in the Mojave Desert. And um, so we were in sand a lot of the time, and we were indoors in uh, a meeting when they called the sanctuary. And uh, we didn't have a break. Uh, for 28 days straight, except towards the end, they gave us a couple of evenings off. So it was very intensive. They wore us out uh, from the start, and at the end, they told us they did that on purpose to uh, break down our defenses. And um, it was quite a trip. So we're, it's, uh, all of these experiences I've described, Luke 13, uh, the Wolf movie, um, uh, meeting all those people in Prague, Ram Das, uh, and uh, this third, 28 days in the desert. Um, they're all like time release capsules. I don't know if you've experienced that, but you have the experience, that, but it keeps unfolding. It, it comes back a lot of times, and uh, you say, oh, so it's still, it's still going on. It's not like a, a once in a, a lifetime thing. Um, big thing, uh, to conclude, the big thing about shamanism, for those of you that may not be too familiar with it, is to place emphasis on the imagination, the imagination. So you have to uh, trust your imagination, which is kind of the first hurdle you need to get over, because uh, you sort of have to check your left brain at the door and trust your right brain. And uh, if a rock says something to you, uh, you take it seriously. So um, the the word is imaginal that somebody created to describe when your imagination is telling you something that's real. Uh, so you learn to trust your imagination. Uh, when you go inside and you see a, a dandelion and it says something to you, you, try, you use your common sense, but you also take seriously what's being said to you. Um, the two main practices of shamanism are illumination and soul retrieval. Um, illuminate both you lie on the table. Illumination is clearing the chakras uh, uh, of, of uh, things that are clogging your energy. And um, soul retrieval, according to shamanic theory, uh, if, if you have a trauma, uh, part of your soul leaves you and goes off into non-ordinary reality, what the shaman or the shamanic practitioner, that's what we are, 
does is travel a non-ordinary reality to bring the soul part back, back and breathe it into you. Um, so tomorrow out in the Bluebell at Kindred Spirits, um, uh, Linda's doing an illumination at nine, and she has somebody for that. Uh, and I will do either a soul retrieval or an illumination at uh, 11. The sessions last uh, about 90 minutes. I don't have a clever line to end with. I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs>